Welcome to the Profitable Painter Podcast. The mission of this podcast is simple, to help you navigate the financial and tax aspects of starting, running, and scaling a professional painting business. From the brushes and ladders to the spreadsheets and balance sheets, we've got you covered. But before we dive in, a quick word of caution. While we strive to provide accurate and up-to-date financial and tax information, nothing you hear on this podcast should be considered as financial advice specifically for you or your business. We're here to share general knowledge and experiences, not to replace the tailored advice you get from a professional financial advisor or tax consultant. We strongly recommend you seeking individualized advice before making any significant financial decisions. This is Daniel, the founder of Bookkeeping for Painters, and today I'm here with John Jacob. John and grew and sold his third-generation home services company. From there, he started building technology for home services. He is the founder of Hoist, a sales app that lets painters win more jobs in less time. How's it going, John? It's going great. Happy to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I'm super excited to have you. And can you kind of tell me the story of your journey with the, the third-generation home services company? And what led you to sell it? Can you kind of... Uh... Yeah, for sure. So I grew up in home services. Like I said, my grandpa started a company back in the early 60s, actually. My dad ran it for years. I remember every summer, you know, working in the office with my parents and even running in the field uh, with my dad, very involved in the family business. But I was always kind of the coder kid, you know, the kid up in his room on his computer, not really going to be in the family business. Always my big brother who's going to take it over. But he took it over and he realized like how much they sorely needed some technology solutions. There were still pen and paper, everything, the entire company running six routes, running route sheets back and forth. It was just crazy. They didn't accept credit cards. There's no website and more. So around 2013, my brother, he like, I remember this text I got. He's like, hey, you want to help me with the family business? Like, let's really do this thing. And it was awesome because I came in and worked with my brother. And within two years, we more than doubled the business. We took it from six routes to 10 routes in the LA area. It was in pest control at the time. And it was just amazing that experience was so transformative for me of just realizing how much opportunity there is in home services with just some good technology put in place. And it was just an awesome experience growing that family business. It was a whirlwind selling that, um, selling that business and my parents got a great retirement out of it. And then from there, I was able to leverage that experience and kind of that passion and knowledge and raise some money in venture capital and start building software for home services and then kind of stumbled into painting as well. Yeah, I think a lot of people kind of poo-poo the idea of of the trades. Uh, and everyone listening probably knows that, you know, the, the trades, there, there's riches there for sure. People make millions in, in the trades. And, and I think a lot of people don't realize that. I think we're starting to realize that as a society, you know, where all these kids went to college and got liberal arts degrees and they now don't have any jobs. They don't have anything. Now they're maybe... Uh, trying to get a job as a painter or something. But if you're, you know, uh, so we've kind of society kind of forgot, oh yeah, you could actually have a, go to trade school. You should go to trade school, actually get, you know, get your hands dirty and, and actually work for a living. Um, but I think, I think that that's starting to come back around and realize people, you know, people are realizing, oh, I can actually make some money at this. Um, and so that's, that's awesome. You, you, so you guys basically went into your, your parents' company and, installed some technology and systematized it and, and, and doubled it in, in, in one year. Is that what you said? Yeah. In, in the course of two years, we doubled that two business years. and sold it. Yeah. Okay. Nice. Was that the, was that the goal starting out? Like, Hey, we want to build it to sell or did that just kind of naturally happen? You know, it wasn't the goal. In fact, my brother and I were like, let's kind of do this forever. But to be totally honest, the ongoing tension of running a family business, kind of the old guard versus the new guard, was not something we thought would uh, keep our family's Thanksgiving still tasting good and be able to really push that business as far as it needed to go. And so we kind of all sat down the table like, what's the best course of action here, given the differences of just running a family business? There's difficulty. Um, and we saw that growth curve that we had built and saw a great opportunity to sell, and we took advantage of it. We're glad we did in hindsight. I think it was a good move for the business. Cool. So- uh, what were the, you were inst helping install technology and processes? What processes um, did you really help install in that in that business to kind of get it to that level? 
Yeah. So when I came in, you know, I didn't have a ton of experience directly in the field. So I had all the technology, marketing, kind of sales experience more coming to the table, worked a corporate mm -hmm. job. And so we immediately broke up the business. It's like, okay, I'm going to be office manager. You be field manager. Like that's anything that happens out there. You handle that. Anything that happens in the office, I'll handle. Of course, there's some overlap. And mm -hmm. so immediately, right, they had a computer system that they weren't fully utilizing. They had redundancies on everything, which is pretty common trend. I hear <laughs> some older people businesses still running, right? They're like, oh, well, we do the invoices online, but we make sure to print everything and file it as well. It's like, okay, let's reduce these redundancies. We have a computer system, let's actually use it. But there was, you know, the obvious ones of overnight, pretty much after I came in, we found a field service management software that allowed all of our field reps to have iPads. So we we're no longer using physical route sheets, right? Um, so I was like, number one, let's get everybody away from physical route sheets, get them into real-time dispatch using iPads out in the field. Like it's such a no-brainer and such huge efficiencies there. Number two was just literally an online presence. There was kind of a website, but no real SEO strategy, no real approach there. And in 2015, it's actually 2013 when I was there, but 2013 to 2015, there was so much opportunity in SEO by just taking it a little bit seriously in SEO. I think more people mm -hmm. have come around to that, but man, did that do wonders for us, just making sure we had a website, with consistent content on it. We had some authority built. It just went so long. I think hmm. obviously we did a lot around, where I put a lot of work in is around our sales processes. So when I came on, there was no real commercial division to speak of. And I was able to stand up the sales processes for commercial and close the Westfield malls in Southern California, which was huge uh, customers for us, punching way above our weight for a family owned business like us. Um, had some real commercial clients come in, which was huge. But I think the other piece was around, and this is really part of what the insights was that led to Hoist is we just came up with standardized price sheets for most of our services on the residential side. And for us, when we had been doing only in-home estimates for everything we did, when we actually had the opportunity to sell over the phone, it was exponential in terms of our growth and just overall efficiency. So, you know, on a busy weeks, we'd struggle to get reps out there to do estimates. So customers were waiting two, three days often. It was frustrating for field reps trying to do their other stuff when they couldn't get that in. Worse, the close rate was like 30%. So we'd spend nearly two hours pricing a lead just to get told we're too expensive or it wasn't a fit. It was constant frustration from homeowners, us, all the sides. So I sat down with my brother, forced ourselves like, okay, we're literally gonna kind of Steve Jobs style, draw a grid here. What are the nine products we sell for residential? And how do we make sure to fit into that and come up with a pricing model that works? So we really hit the books and did that. But committing to that price sheet for us, which was, you know, it ended up being more than nine grid. I think it had like 16 boxes on it that it kind of fell into. But committing to that standardized pricing for us did wonders in terms of the overall sales efficiencies, close rates, and more. And just shifting the primary sales method to phone sales for that business, which we were in pest control, by the way. I don't know if I mentioned that. Mm -hmm. But shifting that primary sales method to, to phone sales for our pest control business, that's really what unlocked our growth more than anything else. And just overall efficiencies. Yeah. That, that's something that I've started to see a little bit more is folks actually trying out uh, remote sales from for, for, for their painting business. Um, Eric, he's a, 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 a he runs a marketing company, Pathfinder, but he also has a painting business. That's something that he's been testing and in, in publicly sharing on his uh, on social media. So it's, it seems pretty interesting. I think there's more interest in that now. And, and people are realizing, oh, oh, this can actually be an effective strategy is to, you know, like you said, not uh, go out and spend two hours on someone who was just tire kicking where you could have just, you know, saved yourself that two hours and, and, and called them from the, from the office or from, from wherever, or hopped on zoom. I think Eric is doing the zoom calls, but yeah, he's doing Zoom calls. Eric has great stuff, by the way. I, I attended his PCA breakout session on remote sales. It was awesome. And he's got all kinds of good stuff. I was going to make sure to shout him out because he's really pushing this space really far. Some great thoughts in it as well. Yeah. So so what what are some of the things that you've learned either from uh, what makes an effective sales process or uh, lead qualification? Um, how, 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 what are the key components do you think that some folks are missing or what, what you found has really worked? I, I think that's really the right question because it's not about are we selling remotely and what that is. That's it's kind of a whole topic in itself. But if you zoom out for a second, it's about having a really strong pricing system, right? That's consistent, repeatable, and a strong sales process. So what is that sales process for you and your business? And maybe that includes some remote stuff, but maybe it's just better qualification. So I think first and foremost, like let's make sure to use our time efficiently. For most people listening to this show, 
the time constraint is going to be the main bottleneck, not necessarily lead volume. Like you can go buy more leads. You can spend more money and get more leads in the door, right? There's possibilities to do that. But oftentimes it's the time constraint of that salesperson, the owner, most times going out and selling. That's going to be, so let's, let's work backwards from that bottleneck and use the time efficiently. So I think first and foremost, a good sales system should include a really good qualification system. And this isn't about, you know, being like, well, I want to make sure it's worth my time. There, there is that element. That's true. But I don't think it's in a dismissive way. I think it's a disservice to the homeowner and yourself to take that time if there's really no chance of ever working together. I mean, fundamentally, I talk with a lot of painters who don't think enough about qualification. And you'll hear me talk about this a lot because they end up literally at someone's home, having driven out there, taking the time to do it, realizing like, oh, actually this job is way too small. Like literally just too small. Or they're asking for things that are beyond our scope. Like we don't do pool coatings because yeah. the default workflow for many painters, even they have appointment setters that do it. It's just like, get the appointment booked, get in the appointment, scheduled as soon as possible. But I think that does us a disservice. You might have a higher qualification rate and more estimate appointments, but that's gonna drag on your close rate and obviously your time. And so I think the first thing I want to talk about is how are you qualifying your leads? Let's take that seriously and think about what are the qualifying questions that are really important to you? Obvious ones, service area, the services they're asking for. There's some other more creative ones, which is like, do you have your own paint? Are you looking to paint yourself? Because that will weed out a lot of people who are really looking for someone really, really cheap, right? So there's some of these classic qualification questions, but a lot of painters are not asking these questions consistently. And I think next from qualification, you have this idea of like, okay, we have that basic information. What is the process by which I get that for either an in-home estimate or produce an estimate from that point? And I think that's oftentimes where things are missed as well. Let's say it's a husband-wife duo, the wife's booking those appointments, getting them scheduled in the account, a calendar. So many times there's not really information passed along from one party to the next. You show up, you're asking all the same questions. I mean, I talk with painters who do their own scheduling and even for themselves, right? They get the inbound call driving from one job to the next. They're trying to qualify that lead. They add another Google calendar while driving. They don't really add any details. They show up like, okay, what did you need done? That's a really poor sales experience from the perspective of the homeowners, right? I talk with a lot of homeowners and that's a really common frustration, which is like, I told you everything I needed done. I even texted it. I filled out the form on your website. You show up, you have no idea what I need done. And we're spending half of our time of the estimate, just like walking around the house, figuring out what I need done. So it's that process. You capture the customer's needs. Like think about this in terms of a buying experience and the customer experience, not just your goals as a painter and your time. Like there's so much, but I think it does come back to that bottleneck of the painter's time. So the two main things I've touched on so far is what is a qualification and what is the like information flow from that qualification to the point at which you're in front of the customer trying to sell them. Let's make sure we're not asking stupid questions, asking the same question over and over or things they don't know or language they don't understand. Yeah. Yeah. The, the first one. So qualifying, do you recommend like a, like I have it just a form when, when they're going to schedule on the website where they ask those questions, like what's your budget or is this a partial project or do, do you advocate like they should actually call everyone who schedules or make sure you get on the phone with them and then like go through a list of questions and, and talk to them or either way you don't care as long as they're doing some sort of qualification. I think either way, I don't care as long as you're doing some sort of qualification. I think it depends on your market and your business and your tolerance of what your drop-off is going to look like on what you want to adopt. I would advocate for form qualifications using forms. Um, like our software has an incredible way to do qualification that's very deep. But even like Drip Jobs has the appointment booking screen that asks you, and you can kind of customize those. And there's a lot of other software that have that, whether it's in your Squarespace site or your WordPress. Like Think about those questions because they can do a lot for you to filter out whether someone's going to be wasting your time. I would say, I don't think it's a good idea to have a raw Calendly or Acuity schedule on your website. There's going to be people booking further out than it's probably ideal, going to be people who maybe aren't serious about the project. I don't think that's a great idea. I think there's good to have another step between that so that you can really verify that client and make sure that they're serious. And that's it's a fit fundamentally. You're not wasting each other's time. Right. I feel like uh, it's uh, Carl Utter who wrote a great book on painting sales. He always talks about like, look, at, there's kind of these third buckets overall. One third of people you get in front of just have no chance of closing. You shouldn't be in front of them. There's a third that are just kind of going to close. Like even a mediocre salesperson is going to close 30%. And there's this last 30% that's up to you. And I think if you have better qualification, you can weed out that first bucket. That's like, we shouldn't even be in front of them. And that to me is just a waste of everybody's time. It's a drag on the overall industry. And that's what I really want to try to avoid for all parties involved. 
Okay. So, but I think if you think about like qualification and handoff, and we think about that flow like an order, I think the next thing is producing a price. So there's a stat that floats around that if you're not providing a bid on the spot, uh, it's you are significantly less likely to close, right? It drags your close down, right? But like a full five or six percentage points on average, which makes a huge difference on a painter's bottom line. But I think producing a bid on the spot is difficult. It's difficult if you don't have the experience and if you don't have a software that supports you well, if you lean on software to produce it, but it makes all the difference in the world. And I found too, if you have the confidence to not have to go out to the truck and spend that 15 minutes to produce that bid and come back, but you can actually do it as part of the qualification education process, it's huge. And the number one way I've seen people do that really well is that before they drive to their estimate, they're doing pre-work if they're using kind of traditional estimation software. So if you're using a drip jobs or paint scout or any of the great software out there, right? Spend the night before hopping on Zillow or that morning before hopping on Zillow, assessing that home, start the bid, get it 80% done. You have a lot of the information you need. You got the basic job breakdown. That way you're not trying to go out to the cut truck, copying and pasting that information. You're, you're there. You already have kind of a ballpark in mind and you could produce that bid and just the couple rounding out those last little details. So I think really think about the process by which you produce a price and make sure that's repeatable. Like, you know, for us, our pest control business, we could boil it down to a price sheet. Obviously painting is not that simple. There's more nuance in pricing a painting job. And I think that's important to capture that nuance preparation more, like right? there's so much nuance in it. But I think having a strong estimation process is huge, a part of a good sales process. Yeah, absolutely. I, and I like your point about doing the pre work doing the pre work. Obviously, you want to try to close on the spot. I think that's conventional wisdom, even though a lot of folks don't try to still close on the spot. But I think a, most folks are moving in that direction. Yeah, I'm trying to close on the spot. But I like the point you made of doing the pre work, and then so you don't have to like leave and go out to the car and, and then, you know, spend a bunch of time outside the home and, and maybe even try to do the the quote in the home with, and that's something that uh, uh, Jason from Contractor Freedom, that's something he has his uh, his sales team do. He does like, he has a huge sales team. They, they do like 10 or 15 million in revenue per year. And so he trains his sales team to actually do the estimate in, in the home because then you'll have more of those interactions with, with the homeowner and their family, and you know they'll they're often offered like, oh, would you like some cookies? Or you know you're kind of at the kitchen table developing that estimate, and they're kind of hosting you almost. And there's just more opportunities to build rapport, and feel like you're you're part of you know part of the home sort of thing. So I think doing that pre work, like you said, can can allow you to 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 have more face time with the homeowner so you're not like going off by yourself and then it's weird coming back in you know do you have to knock on the door or do you just go right in and so there's those awkward uh, moments there so uh, i i like that idea and, and there is this huge burden off the salesperson like i can speak from experience if you walk in with a ballpark price in mind you understand their scope of work like you've done that pre-work you're going to perform better in the actual sale. Like the confidence, the rapport building, you don't have to focus quite as much on counting and calculating, right? You're just making sure what you're seeing is aligning with your expectations and adjusting accordingly. And there's just a, a world of difference when you go in with that kind of preparation ready, ready for that close. And you can focus on that relationship instead of counting and calculating. It, it goes a long way. And for many companies, I've seen the really smart ones they have the admin side do that pre-work of building that bid out, right? So when the admin is doing that booking, they then hop into uh, Paint Scout or whatever they're using and they go build that and scaffold out that bid based on a little bit of information they have. And you'd be surprised how much that saves you so much time when you're out in the field, right? The average estimate appointment doesn't necessarily need to be 45 minutes or an hour. You can get it down to 20, 30 minutes, still have a great close rate um, and still effectively be closing those jobs. And I think obviously the other piece, right? Qualification, handoff of that qualification, the estimation, and then obviously last but not least is follow-up, right? How are you asking for the sale? A lot of painters are kind of like, well, this is the price. They don't even ask like, can we paint your house? We'd love to paint your house. Like that's huge. Ask for the sale, right? That's more like sales tactics. I want to talk more about like the sales process, but follow-up, right? There's a huge percentage of follow-ups that if you stay consistent, it's amazing how many times those bids will actually close. You think they book with someone else, but then that fell through and you actually, because of your follow-up, are able to close. And there's a ton of ways to accomplish that. But I think more than anything, it's have a system, have a playbook. Who's doing it? What's the cadence? What's the follow-up messaging? And something I've learned more recently, which is huge, is like, do your best to have a reason to be following up. 
right? Not just like, hey, just checking in, just following up. It's such a weak positioning and like there's no urgency at all to create. Mm -hmm. But if you can, as much as possible, create a reason to be following up. So it's like, hey, our schedule is filling up for March. I know you wanted this project done before the end of March. Hit me back. Let's get this on the schedule for you. Otherwise, we won't get the job in as I know you need it done. Or a more ideal one would be, hey, did you ever get in touch with... Um, uh, Jimmy, who's the electrician on your project, you know, I referred him. Did you, were you able to get in touch with him? How did that work out? Right. You have a reason to kind of connect and reconnect with them. Another one that I think is great is, hey, I noticed something on your bid. Give me a ring. And they're like, oh, what did he notice? And it's like, there's a lot of things you can come up with to have noticed to be able to create some urgency around that conversation. So they're wondering, is the price still valid? Is it going down? Is it going up? Like, what does he need to tell me? And it really has worked really well for me in terms of follow-up. So think about not only the cadence, the system, who's doing it, what's the content of those follow-ups is really huge as well. So mm -hmm. I think when I think about the fundamentals of a good sales process, those are really key pieces of that. Yeah, and I've noticed some folks will also say they're the estimate like is only valid for 30 or 60 days. And then they'll kind of their follow-up can campaign will basically count down like, Hey, just wanted to, to, to check in with you and let you know that you only have two weeks left on, on the bid on this pricing. Know. Yeah. Yeah. So I just wanted to get you scheduled so we can move forward or whatever. Um, do you have any strong feelings about the, how long you should follow up, you know, uh, if you, especially if you have like some, some sort of automation, like if you're using uh, drip jobs or go. Yeah, that's a great way to do it. High level. Yeah. There's a lot of other options. I don't have strong ones. I think it's good that obviously like the closer to the bid, the more, and then the frequency ramps down over time. Right. Um, but in my opinion, I think about 90 days, they're dead. If you don't have any kind of recurring email marketing going on, or there's not a specialized reason the homeowner's telling you it's scheduled for future date, then obviously, you know, I think about 90 days is what I would call dead. And I think a touch point of like, give or take every 72 hours after you send that bid is probably about right. If you're not doing that, it's probably not quite enough. So you want to be hitting that for quite some time, you know, a few weeks. And it's, it's, it's funny because I thought that I'd be spamming homeowners and selling like this. Um, but most times they're very thankful. Like, oh yeah, I've been meaning to get back to this project. I'm glad you've been bugging me. Yeah. You got fresh on top of my mind. Like I'm ready to move forward now. Right. I do think there's also this idea of really listening to your customer's needs through your process and tailoring your process to the customer's need. So if their thing is, I want to do this when my kid leaves for college on April 15th, you don't really have a reason to follow up until after. Maybe you check in on April 5th and it's like, hey, I know that that's coming up on the 15th. I'll ping you back then. Just know you're on my mind thinking about you. I'm eager to paint your house. Be excited to take on their project. People want to work with people who are excited to take on your project, right? The phrase I love more than anything is like, this job is perfect for me and my crew. We would love to do this project. And homeowners is like, oh, really? My house is perfect? There's, <laughs> a, there's something about that excitement and like genuine enthusiasm that goes a long way for people realizing like, okay, this, not, this guy's not just in it for the money. There's something here that's a good fit. And I mean mm -hmm. that genuinely, like I love doing that work and seeing the results on those projects. Um, but again, back to follow-ups and your sales process tailored to customers' needs, schedule the next time you're checking in. Okay, great. You, you really need to get another bid. No problem. When's that scheduled? Great. Schedule on Friday. Can I call you after they come by? And then we can make sure to compare apples to apples, right? Um, and then I think obviously throughout your whole sales process, there is like thinking about the close and really building the close. That gets more into sales process stuff, which is a lot of people who write great stuff there, whether it's Hermosi or the Carl Utter guy, or there's lots of great people. And it's like, just pick that system though. I think more than anything, the lack of a system is what leads to so much bleed and marketing dollars and wasted hours. It's it's just unfortunate in the industry. Mm -hmm. No, that's, that's great stuff. So qualify, make sure your, inform your information handoff is occurring from the capturing the lead to to go into the estimate producing a price uh, on the spot and also in, in a uh, efficient manner and so you're actually prepared going in and then the last one is making sure you're following up so i think i think i think those are really uh, great pieces of advice um going back to the remote estimating process one of the things that i I'm really interested in talking to you about is is hoist and its ability to facilitate that uh, because one of the you know I was in one of Eric's it wasn't the one at PCA it was uh, one he did before that but he presented on to have his sales process and also the the remote piece to it even though the sales process really doesn't change when you're doing it remotely it's just the technology that you're using is a little bit different, but the the, the core of the process is the same. Uh, it, like with, with the things that you just mentioned, it would all be the same. 
Um, yep. but there are some, some differences, obviously you're not there physically. Uh, so one of the concerns that people had of the remote sales process was like, how, how am I going to know how, how big the, the surface is that I need to paint so I can do my production rights to generate the price. And I think hoist might be able to help with that, uh, with that, with that situation. Is that right? Yeah, absolutely. So we built a specialized tool specifically for remote sales and painting. Um, I mean, the biggest thing and, and how I stumbled on this is I've been working for painters for over four years now, exclusively building technology. And for about two years, we did marketing and appointment setting for painters all over the country. So we worked for over a hundred painters doing their marketing appointment setting for them. And we had a full in-house call center marketing team. So we'd be placing those leads and scheduling those in-home appointments. But we found so many times the main bottleneck was the painter's time. Like we could get more painters, more leads, but we couldn't get their appointments to get them in home. So that was a big part of it. But I met a couple painters in that time who were selling over the phone and they were doing way higher volume, like bananas volume. And that's what led me to like, oh my gosh, this is so much similar to where I was in the pest control business back then, that price sheet and selling over the phone and getting that exponential growth and seeing that breakthrough, not having that bottleneck, having a better consumer experience, it was huge. And so that's really what we set out to build. And the main thing is in the painting industry, there's a lot of great software. We've mentioned of a couple of them today, and there's a ton of ways to get leads. At this point, it's almost commoditized. That's why we got out of that business specifically, right? Tons of ways to get leads. And there's a lot of ways to even produce a bid pretty well. And a lot of ways to drip jobs, like follow up on bid process, do job costing and more like great production tools, huge tools out there. And there are CRMs, they do exist, right? For the follow-ups and more, but there's this really messy slice. And the messy slice for painters is I have a lead. I need to gather the needs from that customer, build rapport and get them to a point where I can produce a price and get enough information from that customer that I can accurately produce a price. And the way that I solve that problem right now as the average painter is I drive, I schedule time with the customer, which customer doesn't even want to do. They don't want to meet with you for the vast majority of the time. They just want to get to a price, right? You're one of many vendors. They're just trying to get a price. So I have to schedule with the homeowner, which takes its own uh, heavy lifting to do. And I lose leads because I can't get on the schedule with some people. Then I need to drive to their house, which is going to take 30 to 45 minutes, maybe longer, depending on if you're a spread out area. Then I walk around at, eyeballing the rooms and I, I have either the notes in my phone is most common what people use or a pen and paper. And I'm kind of jotting down, right? They got two small bedrooms. They want repainted. They got a big kitchen and a breakfast nook, right? Oftentimes I'm not even measuring. I'm eyeballing maybe chicken scratching a couple square footages down. And then from there, I take that stuff and either go out to my truck, read that, pop in those numbers, ballpark the uh, square footage and produce that and come back. So that slice though of, drive into the home just to gather what the home, the, we need two things. We need the information about the home, right? What's the makeup of this home? What's the condition of the home? Like when was it last painted? What do the surfaces look like? And then obviously what work does the homeowner need done that I provide? So sure, they need new floors and they need all this other stuff, but what can I actually provide as a company? I can do the paint and I can do this couple drywall repairs they've got going on, right? And so if you think about it, like that's actually the only two pieces of information I need. Now there's other bigger issues of sales process that need to be solved for that we talked about. Qualification, handoff, their sales, even tactics around rapport building and more that are essential. I'm not saying those need to go away. But that specific piece of just gathering the needs from the homeowner and data about the home, that's what we solve for. And that's where we fit. And that's what this tool is. So we do that in a couple of ways. First and foremost, we have incredible data like no one else about the interior of homes. So we have room by room square footage and room makeup for every home in America. So our algorithms and data sets get you 90% accuracy. You give me a home, you give me an address, and I'll tell you that kitchen square footage will be X. And we have that within 90% accuracy. So that one data point alone is huge, right? And we combine that with our qualification process, which we use these lead forms to qualify customers. You know, it's similar to like you would have a Calendly booking on your website. You can put it on your website. You can also share it individually, text it to them if you get an inbound. Lots of different ways you can share it. But it's basically a dynamic set of questions that starts at their address, augments a bunch of data against it, and then asks some really smart questions that are tailored to what they need done. So for example, they enter their address, it auto-completes for the Google, right? And then it pulls in, it's a three-bedroom, um, two-bathroom house. It's 2,200 square feet. It was built in this year. It pulls that stuff down automatically. Then it asks, is it a full repaint, partial repaint, exterior, cabinetry? What are you looking to have done at your house? And then depending on the data we get and the answers of the homeowner, this is a dynamic qualification form. And mm -hmm. so for them, it takes 
maybe two minutes. They don't have to measure anything. At the end of that process, they have completely built their estimate for you. It's done. They don't see that price instantly. Your phone then pops up and Hoist says, hey, you have a new customer who wants a bid. Here's the price based on your labor rates and labor standards, based on the geometry we know of the home, here's the actual price that you should bid out. And here's why we're confident in that price and what the information is. Now, obviously, it's not going to be for every single home and every single project. I would not recommend, especially where the industry is at right now, that everybody sells remote overnight the way Eric is. It's awesome. I have so much respect. He's really pushing the frontier forward. It's incredible. But I feel like overnight, there's no reason you should be driving to any job below $3,000. That's If you think about your time you're investing and how much drag that is in your sales process, it doesn't make sense. Close that job remotely, focus on the really heavy hitter job, spend more time in person with those customers. Let's make sure your windshield time really makes sense. And then if you actually unlock this remote sales process that we have in Hoist, you have this opportunity to run small jobs really profitably because you're not sinking six hours when you think about the two hours on average to deliver a price with around a 35% close rate. That's like six hours to win one job. Are you really going to spend six hours to win a $1,200 repaint? No. But if you can win that without investing any of that upfront time, 10, 15 minutes reviewing a bid and sending it over, that, make, that could make a ton of sense for your business economically. So yeah. that's that's what we built, how it works in practice and some of our technology. No, that's that's really, that's game changing. I think the, because when I'm looking at financials, you know, I'm looking for folks that have a average job size of five to 10,000. And if they have a lower job size, I'm like, okay, well, that's not good. You're probably undercharging or you're just going after too many small jobs and you're spending too much time, you know, closing it and, and deal with the production and, and your, and their margins are usually bad. But with this, if you can just, like you said, send them a form, they fill it out and you didn't have to really do any work, you, you get the the bid back and you say, okay, well, it's only a $2,000 job. <clears throat> I'm not going to go out and, and do the full sales process, you know, maybe have a phone call or some abbreviated process. And, but I'm going to give them the, the bid still, and that's going to cut, you know, save me a, a few hours of work. And so you could, like you said, still pr produce that profitably. But then if you get a larger, if they fill out that form, they get, a, you know, okay, this is a 5,000, $6,000, $10,000 job. Okay, definitely going to do the full sales process with them, and do the walk around and and be there in person, and spend that extra time. So I think that's that's a really powerful tool that you you can you can serve that underserved market of you know folks wanting you know just a partial paint of their home or whatever it is. It's you also. We yeah, found, like you, like you said, we found it super underserved because of that dynamic you're talking about. And there's actually opportunity for some incredible margins on some of these tiny jobs, right? Like really incredible margins because oftentimes they're not even getting second bids because painters just turn them down. Oh, you're probably two room repaint, just turn them down. Where we're mm -hmm. able to sell those remotely at a huge profit margin. They're actually turned out pretty, pretty incredible for us. Now, I don't want to get too hung up on the small job component because that's only one piece. I think for most painters, they'll want to actually avoid those jobs, maybe not even sell them remotely, which is fine. I think what I'm advocating more than anything is really good qualification and sales processes that take the busy work out of everything and make sure you know before you go if this makes sense right? Like, for example, the way that we're running it, I, I sell paint work, right? Obviously the way we're running it is I come through leads come through. We just explain, we want to make this as quick and painless for you as possible. I'm going to shoot you a link. It takes two minutes for you to complete. And after that, for most bids, we might not have to do an in-home estimate. 90% of inbound leads fill out that form for our company, 90%. And so we have huge uptake and there is, there is a drop-off though. I think it's important to call out. And so for those 10% who don't want to fill it out, we can still run our standard estimate process. It doesn't like mean the lead's gone. And if they balk or it's weird, great, no problem. We can get over there. We still do our similar qualification process, but we don't get that same advantage. Um, but obviously that's a choice you can make in terms of intent. But from there, right, there's that piece of, we see that lead come in. We see that house is built in the twenties. It's in that historic region. It's got a ton of decorative work to done. All right. This is an in-person estimate, right? We follow up. Maybe we give a soft range. No, we're thinking this is going to be like an $18,000 job. This is a huge house, historic home. We want to make sure to do this right. And before we even drive out, right, we have that information. Uh, so I think more than anything, regardless of my software I built, which is pretty awesome, um, I think I'm really advocating for really good qualification and sales process, regardless of whether you're you know, dabbling in remote or whether that's in person. I think there's just huge opportunity there we're leaving on the table. Yeah. 
No, that, that's, that's, that's awesome. That's really good. And how, you know, we talked about data handoff. Um, does Hoist do anything to help with that, that data handoff between softwares if you're using CRM or whatever? Yeah, so we're still, we're pretty early in our journey. So we haven't built any integrations yet, but we're talking with our first users like, okay, what are the integrations we really need? What does that look like in terms of handoff? But if you use Hoist in a vacuum, just in itself, it's incredible handoff for the piece of the sales process we're talking about. So the qualified lead comes in, you walk up to the house and you have all the information on that home. You know, every single room, room size and what needs to be done in every single room. And you know the price already, right? You're ready to go and share that proposal straight out of hoist. So uh, in terms of that handoff, it's incredibly tight and clean. Now we probably have work to do to think about, you know, we have a Zapier integration for getting leads into hoist. So if you're getting leads from anywhere, you can just have them automatically dump into hoist, which is huge. Oh, so yeah. e even if you kind of use it as a sales co-pilot for any of your lead sources, you never even had your homeowners fill out those leads. You're getting all that data augmented about every home before you even go. So it helps you kind of do that prep work that we discussed automatically. You don't have to sit on Zillow and think about it and write it down. It, it just all puts it all in one place. Um, so I forgot the yeah. original question. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, data handoff. Oh, the so handoff. Yeah, that's we we designed it front to back to really solve the handoff between inbound lead all the way to the one estimate. Now, I think there's more work we could do for like, okay, do we then trigger back to the CRM after the estimates one? How do we kick that off into something like drip jobs or paint scouts to handle production and job scossing? We haven't gotten there yet, but we're eager to explore that as well. Cool. No, but that's good that the you have Zapier integration. So if Angie, if you have an Angie Lee come yep. in, it can go plug that information into, into Hoist. It sounds like. And to talk, and to talk exactly. A lot of our painters do that. And to talk about that example for a second, Thumbtack is a use case that's really crazy. Same with Angie's, where if you're the homeowner, think about it for a second. You Googled paint my house and you see an ad that says cost to paint your house. You click on it, you fill out the Angie thing. And all of a sudden your phone is ringing with people who want to get in person. Actually, what I wanted was a price. And mm -hmm. if you're the one painter reaching out that says, hey, you know what? Instead of scheduling in home, just take two minutes. I can get you a price. The qualification rates, if you're on these paid aggregators like this, are way higher using this approach because that's really, that customer is digitally native. They're looking for a price. They're more trying to drop by from that perspective. And the number one way you build trust with someone there is starting the conversation with a price as soon as possible. That's that kind of consumer is what they're looking for is a price. It doesn't mean it has to be the lowest price either. I want to be clear, just selling that price and beginning that process doesn't remove your quality and differentiator as a painter. It's really important to talk about the overall sales process and what that fits into and how the idea of a price builds trust, right? Tesla isn't selling the cheapest cars by any margin, but they just put that price in their website. That has not created a race to the bottom for them. And just this inevitability is coming. Like homeowners more and more want this. Like since Amazon hit its stride 10 years ago, things we never imagined being sold online are sold online. Car insurance. I remember when I was in high school, I literally went to the guy's office and we sat down. I gave him my report card to get my car insurance. Mattresses, 70% last year was sold online. My 65-year-old dad bought his mattress online. Like a mattress. And like that is the trend. That's where it's going. And homeowners are changing quick. And I, mm -hmm. I think that's a while till it really trickles down to home services, but it will go there. And I think it's important we get ahead of that in a way that's really sustainable and that we as painters own ourselves instead of a large company coming in and taking this all from us in some sense. I, I think there's a really unique opportunity and window for painters to evolve with homeowner needs, serve them better, really optimize our time and just make the industry so much better. Yeah. No, that's excellent. Uh, I'm excited. Where do I sign up? <laughs> yeah, happy to. So yeah. it's withhoist.com to answer your question. W-I-T-H-H-O-I-S-T.com. You can email me at John, J-O-H-N at withhoist.com too. Okay, cool. So if you are interested in streamlining your lead qualification process and potentially dabbling in remote sales or not, but just looking to uh, streamline your, your qualification process and your estimating process, to get those those online leads converted to sales, definitely check out withhoist.com. I appreciate your time today, John. Any last words or words of advice or anything else you want to ask of the audience? Uh, not at all. Thanks so much for your time and thank you for all the work you do to help push this industry forward. It's um, amazing to be on the show. Thanks, everyone. Yeah. All right. Thanks, John. And with that, uh, we'll see you next week.